Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Proactive Risk Management for HSEQ, Past, Present, and Future, sponsored by ETQ. This is Alan Ferguson, Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I will moderate today's session. Thank you all for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a few minutes, but first, I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speaker and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Sean Salvis, the HSEQ Product Manager at ETQ. Sean has field consulting and management experience in the development, implementation, and improvement of environmental, health and safety, and sustainability systems. Sean is known for creating a strong safety culture by using sound judgment in managing occupational hazards and risks while producing innovative and practical solutions to ensure a safe and compliant workplace. Sean has spent the last 10 years at Fortune 100 companies focused on the semiconductor, aerospace, and technology sectors. Sean, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you for the introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those on the phone. I appreciate your time today. So today we're going to definitely talk about some risk management and uh, more specifically proactive and some more enhanced risk management tools and methods. So for the agenda today, we're going to start out as what is proactive risk management? We're also going to look at the types of risk, and we'll look at several different risks in terms of um, not only HSEQ or health, safety, environmental, and quality risk, but also in general, uh, what risk is this in the environment and in general. We'll also look at four different methods of risk, and we'll start out with more of a reactive approach and looking at um, also maturity levels of different risk management methods. We'll move on to proactive risk management and then go into predictive and prescriptive risk management and also analytics. From there, we'll go into some more examples. We'll look at how we can leverage people, processes, and innovative technologies. And then we'll look at some more business cases. We'll look at how we can use some of these risk management tools in the environment and industry and also some return on investment opportunities for those out in industry. So we'll conclude and have any questions that you guys um, and girls may have. And from there, we'll talk more. All right, to start off, we'll just say, what is proactive risk management? Um, the main thing here is that proactive risk management improves an organization's ability to avoid or manage both existing and emerging risks and helps adapt quickly to unwanted events or crises. Um, the big thing here is we're looking at drivers of risk and uh, looking at managing root causes rather than the symptoms of risk. Um, at ETQ, we do have a very robust structure for risk management. All of our processes do look at risk management um, in many of our software packages and suites. Um, so I encourage you to uh, look us up, and also uh, we can talk more about some of our risk strategies and how we look at it in the industry. So types of risk, and on this list right here you'll see is actually from PricewaterCoopers. They're very heavy in auditing and insurance, uh, tax and consulting. Uh, this really does apply to all industries, though, in a way. Uh, this looks at your EHS processes um, and also financial and other processes. So um, you'll see many right here, one being credit. You know, credit's really big in financial terms. Uh, you know, risk from borrows, for example, or meeting your obligations. 
We also have compliance risk, and that's a big part for EHS or HSCQ, uh, looking how you stay in compliance. You know, what's the risk of getting out of compliance? Um, and all the methods you need to actually stay in compliance, looking at different laws and regulations for your local region, looking at policies and procedures, and also how you conduct business. We also look at risk in terms of customers and even stakeholders, um, evaluating risk profiles of certain customers and how they could potentially impact the organization's reputation or even financial position. There's a risk of fraud, and this is especially important in the financial uh, sectors as well, looking at instances of fraud, um, not only can it affect your ethics and compliance centers, but also your business practice requirements, and your financial reporting and integrity. IT, a big risk here, especially these days. So in, for information technology, looking at the potential for system failures, uh, factors such as processing capability, uh, capacities, any access control issues, or even data protection and cyber security crime. Internal and external auditing. You know, we know this really well in EHS um, and quality having not only internal or even corporate auditing, but having external stakeholders look at processes that are going on in industry or organization. This can, um, you know, this could really in impact your strategy, your financial, operational, and compliance objectives, um, and even down the road, impact your customer value. There's market risk. There's uh, always risk in market. So market movements are a big thing, and how they impact your organization's performance or even risk exposure. And then you go into operational risk, uh, loss from inadequate or failed internal processes, looking at your people and systems, and even external events. There's product risk. Um, you may even know uh, product stewardship is a big part, looking at cradle of grave. So what are you doing to make sure your product is meeting these, these uh, guidelines and making sure that your product is designed and developed in a way that is sustainable and is good for the environment? There's project risk. You know, are you on time? Are you looking at your timelines? Are your deliveries on time? Um, are you implementing projects properly? And then how do they affect your stakeholders if you are not on time, for example? And then we have security. So we have potential breaches in assets, for example. We have strategic risk, which can even go into your missions or your, even your organization's strategic objectives. And then lastly on this list, we have supply chain risk, looking at inputs and logistics, necessary to create products and services. This is just an idea of some of the risk out there, as many as you may know. And I want to actually go into just HSEQ risk. You know, this is more specifically on the environmental health and safety side. Um, just looking at the types of risks you have and the ones that you'll see in industry, and this is typically just for one department, for example. You may have, you know, a chemical exposure, for example. You might have an ergonomic issue or even employee injury from tripping. You might have a containment issue where you might have chemical or even oil getting out of a containment area or secondary containment area. You could have risk for your permits, exceeding air emissions limits for the month. The list goes on. You know, there's so many risks out there, as you may know. It's a matter of mitigating and having the right approach to making sure that you guys are in compliance and making sure you mitigate risk. So typically in risk management, we have it's very related to a, a maturity curve, essentially. So on the lower part of a curve, a lot of times you have, um, you know, not, not too many processes. Things are typically segregated a little bit. There's not too much integration. A lot of things are done ad hoc. And then as you move up the curve, you tend to get more optimized. You tend to have more defined processes, more integration. Um, things are more, you know, essentially performance-oriented. There's more indicators. Um, a lot of times this is kind of how, you know, organizations work. And the way we see it is a lot of organizations are kind of in the, you know, repeatable define area. Most are really obviously trying to move towards the managed and optimized part of the curve. And we see this also in risk management strategies. We see the highest and the, the, more, the ones that are more proactive, more predictive on the higher part of the curve, typically up in the managed and optimized stage, there's really that communication, that social collaboration where people are talking to each other. They're using progressive analytical tools to look at the risk. We're losing feedback loops to look at what's going on in the facilities, and also using continuous improvement to drive their operational excellence. So this is where we see it. We see a linkage between this. Um, many of our customers we talk to, we see this as well, where you know a lot more communication, more the behavior-based aspect of things, looking at risk and talking about it daily. So we'll start off the reactive approach. And as we go through this, I want to uh, look at this not only from what is typically done in history, but also 
Um, some of the positives of certain approaches too. You know, reactive tends to have a negative connotation a lot of times, saying that you're doing things after the fact. I think, you know, a safety incident has already happened. You're just basically keeping it under control, which is true in many cases, but there are also some positives too. And we'll get to that down, down the line in a few more slides. But a lot of times, you know, I like to, you see a picture of Harrison Ford down there from Indiana Jones. His quote really was, you know, I don't know, I'll think of something in his last crusade movie. Typically, he ends up going and jumping on things and getting in trouble and, you know, running away from rock. So that's kind of the thing you typically see in reactive approach. I'll think of something, and that's, you know, a lot of times people think of that. Um, the majority of teams and managers typically rely on this approach if they don't have a robust safety program. Um, and nothing is really done about risk until something goes wrong. So they typically have a firefighting approach. Crisis management, if you hear that term a lot, that is typically the approach in terms of this management technique. And, um, and that's, you know, that's the way it is. I mean, the thing with reactive approach is you're trying to fix something that's already happened. Um, but I will talk about some of the positive things, too, as we go on. So in the scale of maturity, it's often perceived as the lowest or most basic form of risk management. And the idea is really propagated mainly because it is generally associated with programs that are early in implementation, so they're not very mature. Um, and they often lack a proactive safety culture. So people are not going proactively looking out for leading indicators, looking for things that they could fix, looking for predictive solutions. It also be referred to as underdeveloped risk management. So typically, you know, and, and some of these may even, might even be from not having enough data or even safety data to really make a decision. So that's what we call underdeveloped right here where they're maybe just starting out with safety programs. They're looking for some data sets to really address some of this risk. So with that being said, you still can have some positives from reactive risk management, even if you're early in development. You may be able to mitigate safety events. You can minimize damage from critical safety situations. This is something that's really big in the SMS industry, you know, the uh, aviation industry especially. If you have any kind of deviations, any kind of issues, how do you actually react to that? Are your people trained to address this risk even if something happens? That's a big part of it. You know, you have to make sure your people are trained and make sure you have that culture, even if you're early on or even if you um, have something happen, because risk and issues are going to happen. How do you actually tackle that and take care of it and make sure things don't get worse? Um, and also having the ability to act, act quickly and efficiently in response to any under the rail events. Um, what's your response to the issue? And high-quality decision-making. So what's, your, what's, your, what's the effect on your you – know, what are you going to do with threats or risk? How are you going to – basically uh, tackle that. So how do you use reactive, uh, reactive risk management and what's the best approach to this and what's the best strategy for this? Typically in new HSCQ programs, that's typically where you'll see this uh, reactive approach. Um, they're not able to practice proactive or predictive risk management typically at that stage, um, but it's also useful in response to safety events as we alluded to. And then dealing with threats and that's only arise from the operating environment. So if you have something that happens, you know, how do you address it? And then what does it typically require for the reactive approach? Well, you typically need training for all employees. So no matter what time of type of approach, you need to make sure that your employees are trained on how to actually reactively um, take care of something. You need to make sure you have a strong bureaucracy of, regarding safety behavior. You know, what are your policies, procedures, your checklists? You want to have a list of your desired employee behavioral actions and make sure you have a strong hazard and risk fluency for identifying and assessing safety items. So the next approach we'll look at is proactive risk management. Typically, you know, in history, this is referred to as the highest form of risk management. Um, and this is typically used for programs that are more mature. I'm not saying that they're all mature, but they typically have a little bit more, few, more years, more data sets to really look at. And they're typically able to identify precursors that lead to threats and risk. Um, and these are really the goals of them, and identify threats before they lead to risk, and also understand the actual safety inputs, the actual causes that lead to safety performance. So what do you really need to practice proactive risk management? Well, you need a great deal of HSCQ data. You need to have data sets to know what has happened. Uh, you need to have the ability to monitor complex metrics and make sure you have a, a mature safety culture. Um, that being said, there's no reason that any new HSC programs can partially adopt some proactive risk management strategies. 
um, as we alluded to earlier with the newer programs. Um, you know, you can handle and monitor a handful of leading indicators, even if you're just starting out. And it's also important to remember that proactive risk management is not simply a, a concept or a, a better vision or a better version of reactive risk management. They are different in a way, and they involve specific activities that are, you know, quite different. They both complement each other, but they're used in different situations. So what are they best used for? Well, they're typically used for identifying potential issues before risk occurs uh, when trying to understand the inputs of the program and uncovering precursors to risk. Um, you know, and identifying potential issues, this is typically when you're uh, looking at threats from emerging uh, or when hazards are increasing in severity. For inputs, you're typically looking at underlying behaviors, you know, your attitudes, your actions, that directly correlate to your safety performance. And any kind of precursors you're typically looking at with the relationship between a certain hazard, a threat, and a risk. Now, the big thing about this, and with any risk management program, is you need to have buy-in from all employees, including management. You know, your frontline employees are just as important as your management. They all have to agree and follow that risk management methodology, no matter what approach you're taking. So the main steps for proactive risk management, they can pretty much be broken up into four main areas right here. Uh, we talk about the identification part, also analyzing ranking and development. Uh, you probably have seen the FMEA approach, the failure modes and effects analysis. This is typically pretty similar to what you would see for proactive risk management, where you're essentially doing some kind of ranking um, and then sorting and essentially at attacking risk or addressing risk based on what you see as the highest risk. And, um, and severity to, you know, either property or your people or even exposures. So this is typically the, the type of flow you would see right here. In terms of identification, you're typically looking at any kind of possible risk, you know, really recognizing what can go wrong and what may go wrong. In terms of analyzing, you're really looking at, you know, can each risk, uh, can you estimate the probability that will actually occur and the impact of it? You know, what kind of damage can you expect by the probability and the impact? And then in terms of ranking, you know, the risk by probability and impact, you know, your impact may be, it may be nothing, it may be negligible, it might be marginal, it might be even critical or catastrophic as you typically see in the FME approach. And then making sure you actually develop a plan or a contingency plan to manage these risks with the highest probability and high impact. So this is mostly related to, you know, FME is a very good example in terms of this proactive approach right here. Uh, many of you have probably used this in the past. Uh, this can be used for many different, you know, ways in EHS also quality. Um, I've used it in quality quite a bit. Um, in terms of quality defects and looking at what can affect the product. So just want to give you an idea of kind of a background and some of the, some of the uh, tools you can use for this. And there's also some principles of proactive risk management that uh, you should be aware of. And the biggest thing here, you know, I think is maintaining a goal perspective, knowing that um, you're looking at things from a system, systematic approach, that um, anything can really affect another part of the system. Uh, making sure you make proper business uh, plans to make sure you mitigate risk. And also have a forward-looking view. You know, we proactive has that word looking forward anyway. So making sure you're looking out for the future as well and what could happen. And an open, encouraging open communication, making sure that all your stakeholders and users are putting out risk at any time, making sure you have the dialogue and, and talking to each other and being open about it. And also integrating risk management. This is something at ETQ that we really do uh, quite well. Where we integrate risk management in all of our processes that our customers are using. Um, anything that you choose to do or any task you choose to do will have some kind of risk uh, attributed to it, and we uh, integrate this and, and see this as an integration point. Really looking at consideration of risk into all processes. And then emphasizing a continuous process of risk management. So looking at risk um, as more becomes known and adding any new risk as better insight is essentially achieved. And developing that shared vision. This is where that buy-in comes in and having your frontline employees and your management all involved, making sure that um, everyone's talking and facilitating better risk identification and assessment. And then encouraging that collaboration when managing risk, um, making sure you get the proper stakeholders involved, making sure you pull the skills and experiences from all your stakeholders whenever you're doing any kind of risk management activity. So now we'll move on to the predictive side. Now, this is, um, as we talked about the maturity curve, this, you know, proactive, predictive, and prescriptive are pretty much in the top of the curve in terms of risk management. 
Um, predictive is a bit different than proactive risk management, as you may know. Um, this is getting more into the technology part that I want to get into later in this presentation about some of these different methods that companies are using and organizations are using to look at risk. Now, the big thing with predictive risk management is that um, it is often confused with proactive risk management. Um, they do typically look at a, an audit trail, essentially, looking at the historical, you know, sometimes even lagging indicators of what has happened and using that to forecast what could happen in the future. Um, they will identify possible risk in a situation based on a given circumstance, and you can identify any kind of threats in hypothetical scenarios, and then anticipate any needed risk controls. On um, that picture you see below, that's kind of a one way of looking at it where you're essentially collecting the data, it may be the historical data, and then actually cleaning it, uh, sorting it, having that hindsight perspective, identifying any kind of patterns, which would be your insight, and then making your predictions, which would be your foresight. Um, the other term here, too, that you might hear is your predictive analytics, and that really is a uh, thing that's used quite a bit these days, looking at any kind of unknown future events. Um, a lot of times you'll hear about data mining, stats, modeling, machine learning, artificial intelligence. This is the kind of technology that's being used with predictive analytics to analyze current data and essentially make predictions about the future. So it is quite useful and very useful in terms of following activities that are common to HC2 programs. Um, it's used actually quite a bit in management of change or MOC. Also in the analysis and hypothetical scenarios and forecasting performance data, uh, especially to stakeholders. And also um, a little bit related to predictive risk management is you'll, you may hear key risk indicators. Um, it's a little bit different, but it is typically talked about with this type of risk management technique where you're looking at metrics. Uh, these metrics are typically used by organizations to provide an early signal of increasing risk exposures in various areas. And they typically have the measurable, predictable, comparable, and informational aspects to it. And essentially the measurable parts of KRI is that they're basically metrics that should be quantifiable. So they have to be some type of number, numerical value, um, either a count or percentage. It could be even a dollar. Uh, value, and then predictable. So you have to have, make sure you have any kind of early warning signs, so a signal, for example. And then anything that's comparable, so it has to have some kind of trending. That's where the uh, proactive, or I say predictable risk management has that trending as well. This also looks at tracking over a period of time. And then having the proper information available, to be, you have to have the ability to measure the status of the risk and the control. And these are typically where uh, KRIs come in play. They do have a bit of relationship, and they typically get talked about with the predictive risk management. Now, KRIs typically enable organizations to identify current risk exposure and any emerging risk trends. They also highlight control weaknesses and allow for the strengthening of poor controls. They facilitate the risk reporting and escalation process, and they also allow for operational risk management to add value to your organization. And the last part of risk management we'll look at is the prescriptive side of risk management. Now, this is looking at a few different things. Uh, it actually looks at the predictive side as well, but it also has a, another layer that looks at the decision tree and also the effects of what's been uh, decided on. So a lot of times, prescriptive risk management comes in play. Operations research is probably the one you most likely would hear a lot that goes into this. Um, you know, if you see the chart below, you can kind of see some of the areas that it gets involved with. Uh, stats, again, you know, apply statistics. Also looking at you know, your, your meta heuristics and also image processing and then machine learning as well. So getting into some of these, uh, you know, edge devices, tech, tech, uh, technologies, Internet of things, all this stuff is really coming in play with prescriptive risk management um, as well as predictive as well. So in terms of this, this is really uh, looking at the best course of action for a given situation. And it is, as I mentioned, related to both descriptive and predictive analytics. So it's really a combination of those. And I just want to bring this up, too, in terms of, you know, where organizations are going in terms of all these different types of analytics, predictive and prescriptive. Um, IBM does quite a bit of this research, and they, they typically talk people process technologies and how it's really pushing business performance and having that process excellence, transformational leadership, and adaptive culture to drive that the excellence. 
And as you can see in that chart on the, on the bottom right, people are investing in these risk management tools, these predictive and prescriptive risk management tools. Modeling, as you can see, is one of the highest percentages for what people are implementing in their organizations and their efforts. Um, you can see 87% right there, the modeling tools. Risk assessment tools in general are up there in the percentages, there, and also business intelligence and uh, dashboards. You can see quite a bit of organizations are looking into this, and this is a big part of uh, what people want to do, and they want to mitigate risk. So we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit right now. We talked about the four main types of risk management, reactive, proactive, uh, predictive, and prescriptive, and also talked about you know, how each is used for different situations, also based on maturity and even the positives um, and how they can be applied for different organizations. I want to go into now just some of the different examples and also business cases regarding how some of these risk management tools can be used and in what industries as well. So looking at you know, manufacturing, healthcare, logistics, just different technologies that are being done and different risks that different industries are facing right now. The first one I want to go into here is manufacturing risk. This is a big one for HSCQ or EHS. Manufacturing risk is always there. And this is a, most of these will be technology examples to get an idea of what some of these companies are doing and just in general what different industries are looking at these days. So some risk you might have in manufacturing, uh, cost control is a big one. So essentially, you know, how do you reduce the maintenance costs? How do you reduce production waste, for example, or even warranty costs? And any extra reserves or inventory holding, a big thing for quality as well. And also, how do you reduce the risk of, you know, productivity issues and efficiency issues? So a lot of these companies are looking at reducing interruptions, for example. How do you optimize line flexibility and even employ productivity? So some of these uh, companies and manufacturing companies are looking at more automation, looking at streamlining uh, lines, looking at the flow of the actual manufacturing lines, as we'll look at in a little bit later. Um, and then also the actual customer experience. So, you know, looking at early warning signs, any risk issues with quality, looking at how you can maximize your asset utilization, for example, and create additional service offerings and revenue streams. So that's just an example for manufacturing. If we go into travel and transportation, even logistics, there's also some examples of risks that are out there that companies and organizations are looking to mitigate. So if you look at logistics here, um, some of the things that are looked at are, you know, multi-model, inter-model shipment cycles. Um, in terms of carriers themselves, we're look, you know, people are looking at increasing the asset utilization. And also service levels, just like we talked about before, increasing the service levels and improving employee productivity. In terms of shippers and re recipients, uh, companies are looking at more visibility and also condition monitoring and also more regulatory requirements and inventory optimization. And then healthcare, a uh, big, big topic these days. There's always risk and always has been risk with healthcare. Um, so change the dynamics, you know, how does that affect some of the risk that's out there? Um, we know there's the aging population and also aging workforce. So that's a big part of the, the risk that's out there in healthcare. Um, there's also the rising cost of healthcare and, and also R&D. So, you know, how we look at the shifting demographics to emerging markets. And how do we actually personalize, you know, medication, for example, and, and alliances and partnerships to enhance um, healthcare? And also from the globalization perspective, you know, how does that affect risk for healthcare? Patient care and safety. This is a big one right here, uh, not only for disease management, but uh, wait times, for example, you know, risk of the customer walking out or not going through the process and then getting sick. Uh, wait times for primary care, you know, as we know, they, they can be quite long. And any kind of restrictions or patient readmission and cost-efficient treatments and care delivery. All these are risks right here. Um, the other thing I would say, too, in patient care from an ergonomics perspective is the actual lifting a lot of times on nurses out in the field, looking at how people are lifting patients, for example, and looking at the risk that's involved the, the back in terms of that. That's a big thing I've seen in the industry personally. I mean, the quality and compliance perspective, um, the quality governance and then the evolving regulations, um, how do we decrease medical errors, for example, and then make sure that we have secure drug supply in the chain, uh, secure drug supply chain management and patient reported outcomes. So just a few examples there for some of the risk that's out in the healthcare industry. And we move on to energy and utilities. Um, so this is another thing that we have quite a bit of risk in, um, those of you that are in this industry. 
So how do we improve reliability, make sure the lights are staying on for, for customers? And then also looking at your data and monitoring process across the asset value chain. How do you conduct secure operations? And make sure you have, you're gaining reliability insights and extending life to assets and enhance personal productivity and safety. The actual operations themselves, you know, how do you monitor and track the health of your assets you know, out there in the field? And then make sure you improve your productivity and monitor your supply chain. How to use more predictive approaches to reduce your material and labor energy costs. And creating new value. You know, how do you create new revenue streams based on these new technologies that are out there and new integration and services? So we'll go into a few specific business cases now in terms of risk. So um, these are ones that I've uh, seen personally and also um, you know, have dealt with and um, found them quite interesting, actually. So Scansco, they're actually in real estate um, and also uh, development. They do quite a bit of the construction as well. So they are looking at their business risk as environmental exposure to personnel. So they have a pretty much a new app or you could say even a um, centralized hub for capturing environmental data and notifying personnel. Essentially, uh, similar to IH monitoring or industrial hygiene monitoring, they're able to capture all this exposure data in a central hub that essentially, if you have your mobile device on you, will notify you of any changes to you know, vibration, to dust control, um, can be used in hospitals, for example. Um, and it's quite, quite useful in terms of alerting employees and giving them the proactive warning that something might be going out of spec or even um, an environmental issue. So I found it quite interesting, and this is some of the technology, the risk management technology that's coming out there, and it's actually being used today. And another example for business case, uh, Intel Corporation Semiconductors and Honeywell Aerospace, um, and Honeywell in general, actually, they have collaborated on a proof of concept looking at this risk in terms of environmental exposures as well, similar to Scanska. So they actually have implemented a uh, essentially smart system, smart PPE and monitoring devices for capturing all vital information and environmental data that essentially can give you real-time information, communications um, of any kind of slip, any kind of uh, worker down, um, even give you fit check notifications on when things need to be addressed or even when your, uh, you know, your filter or whatever your respirator needs to be uh, recalibrated, for example. So, or, or at end of life, for example. So this is the kind of thing that is being used. I'm also used in firefighting as well, where you can actually have, um, you know, it gives you real-time data. You can actually talk, and it will actually communicate to your dispatch or, or the person that's working on the other side of the issue. So this is the kind of stuff that's being done that's, that has that collaboration, as we were talking about earlier, in terms of um, really being proactive about risk management and giving real-time insights on what's going on. So we'll go into some more company examples here. Um, so BASF, they are a German, one of the largest German chemical companies, actually. They also have risks in terms of customer demands and needs. So if you look into some of these case studies, they have quite a bit of information on these if you look online um, as well or any of your uh, publications. But um, feel free to do this on the side after this presentation. But yeah, BASF does have quite a bit of risk in this aspect in terms of making sure they get the proper product to the customer. So what they have done is they have actually um, implemented an RFID tag system that attaches to empty soap bottles. Essentially, the assembly line communicates to the production machines what kind of soap, fragrance, or labeling is required based on the customer orders. So with customized ordering from the customers, uh, make sure that everything is done exactly as needed. And then Airbus, another example, in the aviation industry. So their risk is their time to manufacture and the reliability. So um, just like many manufacturing, this is always a big thing, a big cost, is your time of manufacturing. How quickly can you get a product out of the plant? This applies to automotive to any part, any widget, essentially. So Airbus, they essentially um, applied Internet of, of IoT technologies to its products, and they essentially have factory floor employees using tablets and smart glasses to assess a task and then send information to a tool for completion. They can basically set up something in their tablet or phone, and it will actually go to a robotic tool for completion. And then we have Caterpillar, which many of you are familiar with. So they have a risk management issue of failure of equipment. So their solution is a product to prepare before failure technology, along with fleet monitoring and fuel efficiency tracking. So essentially, they 
want to empower their customers with the insight necessary to shift from a reactive repair after failure to more of a proactive repair before failure stance. And the end result here is that they have more efficient operations and also increased fleet availability for their customers. Siemens, another example. So they have gone down the route of a smart factory. Um, this is they make quite a few machines for you know automotive, for example, BMW being one of their customers. They have a you know make quite a few machines for them. They have a risk of high cost, so they got proactive and actually increased the efficiency and cost reduction through smart factory initiatives. Essentially, 75% of their factory is automated now. So most of their employees are literally working on computers to manage all their production. So that's one way that they address that in terms of risk management. And then we'll look at Fison and Krupp Elevator. So they also had a risk in terms of equipment failure. So this is looking at the proactive maintenance part of it and a predictive maintenance solutions. So essentially they were able to um, connect thousands of sensors and systems within their elevators and then essentially monitor everything from the motor temperature uh, to a shaft alignment to any other issues within the actual elevator itself using their Microsoft Cloud-based Azure Intelligent System Service. So another system right here where they're using devices, this really is looking at Internet things as well, where you have connected devices and you know, having uh, sensors and stuff built in so you're aware of what's going on and any risk that may arise. So now we'll shift into ROI, and this is uh, pretty much the last part of the presentation. I wanted to go into some of the return on investment opportunities in terms of risk management and being more proactive. Um, a lot of times in organizations, it is tough to really pitch you know, to get something, you know, essentially move forward unless you have a, a business case for it, you know, really having that money backing to show that you're going to create value. This is where ROI really comes in play. Um, a lot of times we're looking at, you know, the reactive approach, looking at, you know, lagging issues, how we can reduce injuries. But the big thing here is, you know, how can some of this proactive risk management really help and, um, and drive this, this risk management, this proactive risk management? So ROI is really any initiative that delivers measurable value um, should be an option, essentially. And it's more likely to be supported, you know, proactive risk management is essentially more likely to be supported and accelerated if you can fit it into a cost justification process. Essentially time, you know, in this case, we're looking at time savings in terms of cycle time and how it can be converted to money. So these are just some examples of some products that would result in ROI, ones that are really effective and efficient in reducing hazard exposures, ones that eliminate or substitute risk. Um, as we look at these risk types right here, a lot of times they go through the hierarchy of, of controls. So elimination is always the best, and then substitution, engineering, and administrative. Finally, PPE. So looking at these different controls and what you can really, really change is, is a big part of it. And also enhancing your work practices. So how can you make things more productive, uh, really generate that money? And the big thing is look at the low-hanging fruit as well. Start with your low-cost, high-impact items when addressing risk. So as an example here, I wanted to uh, kind of just start off here. This is a cost-benefit analysis example. So just looking at, you know, a couple of these examples here, um, you know, a new patient lift, as we talked about earlier with the healthcare, you know, just by having maybe an example of a $5,000 lift, you are basically able to reduce injuries by 50% in your facility. That would essentially equate as a ratio as equal to five just by implementing that device. Now, that's really essentially the avoided cost, cost of investment calculation. The other way to look at it is a cost effectiveness calculation, where you're looking at the cost of intervention, uh, intervention divided by your anticipated avoided events. Let's say you have new lighting that goes in play that's at $12,500. This new lighting from you know, investigation research would decrease your falls by 25%. So essentially, each fall, let's say it's $15,000, you can get a, a savings of 30,000 minus 12.5 to be 17.5. So just, just simple examples to give you an idea of some of these cost benefit analyses to really push the proactive risk approach and, and get people looking at it. So for this example, I want to go into ergonomics risk. And this is uh, something that I have quite a bit of knowledge in and have, have worked in in industry quite a bit and have had to justify for, in terms of value, how we can address risk for ergonomics. So the big thing that um, we looked at is the seven ways to lean. Ergonomics does fall under these one of these wastes. 
and maybe under quite a few of these actually, but motion waste is one of the big parts of ergonomics, and this is how we pretty much address, um, you know, how we can get costs and get costs down, essentially generate revenue from ergonomics. So what we've done is, you know, one, one way to look at it is, you know, product flow risk. So essentially, how is your line set up to manufacture? You know, do you have people having waste in motion? And then you can actually measure cycle times of getting a product out, and then if you reduce that cycle time, that equals money. And also may even reduce injury rates based on the type of motion. So, you know, a lot of factories, um, you know, luckily many of them are moving to a more of a U-shaped method, but a lot of times they have, you know, the risk of having a continuous, pro, continuous product flow and also excessive walking with the product itself. So if you redesign it to a U-shaped work cell, you not only improve your product flow, but you reduce your prolonged multiple handling situation. You know, for this example, you could have a motion savings of 37.5 seconds per cycle, just as an example. Uh, we actually implemented this just uh, as an example at Hasbro um, Games, actually, where Monopoly was being built. And essentially by switching out the traditional method of flow to the U-shaped, not only were ergonomics improved with the twisting motion, but also the flow was a lot better. We have one person working at the beginning and end of line with the U-shaped method. So just to give you more of an ROI, so certain formulas you guys may want to use for productive risk management. Um, so for this one right here, you can essentially look at your projected productivity impacts. You know, this is really applicable to ergonomics especially. Um, you can also look at your annual savings. You know, your, your impact times your annual direct cost, and then your payback period. And this is a big thing uh, for organizations. They want to see the payback period. You know, will I get my money back by implementing a new process or piece of equipment um, to mitigate risk? So just as an example of a short-term solution, just some simple things you could do to get that ROI. Um, let's say that you have a team out there that's illustrating a you know, 0.7 second time saving, essentially resulting in lowering a tool. And also, by doing that, you're also improving your work posture. Uh, that's just one change right there. Let's say also that the parts that your, your person was using was moved just a little bit closer so that's within reach. That reach, making it more reduced and not having an extended reach, essentially would cause a 0.5 second time savings. That combined essentially is a 1.2 second time saving. And if you divide that by your total cycle time, there's a 12% productivity impact right there alone. So that's just a short, you know, easy example without even buying anything of what you can do to get money and reduce risk because the postures are improved and also your cycle time in terms of getting products out on time is, is reduced. So if you were going to more of a long-term solution, you may even look at different pieces of equipment. So this is where you might have an initial investment where you might buy a new, a new item, new piece of equipment. In this case, we're using a, an automated press, which essentially it's at a cost of $5,000. So let's say that you have this piece of equipment. Let's say that your annual direct cost is $50,000, as an example. But by having this automated press, your projected productivity impact is 5.7 seconds now as opposed to 1.2. So that's going to make a 57% impact. And now let's say that you have that multiplied by your direct cost. That's a $28,500 savings right there, which payback in payback period years is literally just a little bit over two months. And if you have a one-year ROI, you can have a 470% result ROI for the one year. So just to give you an example, this is something um, you may want to do. Um, you probably have done in your in organizations to really push proactively addressing risk. And this is uh, you know, more specifically towards ergonomics, but can really be addressed for other issues as well. So in conclusion, there are, we talked about quite a bit. We looked at different risk methods. There are many different risk methods out there, and they do have many different uses based on um, typically maturity level, but also just, you know, you know how it's applied or, or what you guys are looking at. You know, some places may be new in terms of their safety programs. Some may have a robust safety program, but still may use some of these other methods. Um, reactive, for example, to make sure that they can keep crises down or or even know how to behave if a crisis happens, so which is also important as we talked about. Um, we also have talked about quite a bit of, bit of technology. Um, Internet things is a big thing and having a lot of these connected devices. We talked about some of those business cases in terms of, you know, BASF, Airbus, Caterpillar, Bison Krupp, and some others. Um, really, technology has brought risk management to a whole new level, and it's only going to keep progressing. You know, there's even more talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, 
Um, if you guys look at, you know, you guys have probably seen all the talk about that. Um, more automation, um, driverless cars, all that stuff is really coming out. And, you know, how is that going to affect the risk of what is being done? So we need to look at this. A lot of it is really good and it's really going to help risk management move forward. Um, but it's, a lot of it's going to be have to have, have, having some data capture as well to make sure that it is actually affecting and, and uh, progressing. The other thing, too, is I want to make sure you guys are considering ROI when showcasing risk management products and strategies. This has always been a thing um, in terms of really showing the value. ROI has a big, a big impact, and it's, it's really one of, one of the main ways to really show that it's, it's going to help your organization. Obviously, having your instance rates low is really important. It's a huge thing, and staying in compliance is a huge thing, but that ROI is really going to push um, EHS in general forward and, um, and showing that it's really generating a lot of value. And then just to give you an upcoming thing that's coming up, so ETQ will be at the EHS Today Sick Leadership Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. So for all of you that are in the area, I would welcome this. I would love to see you guys. And we can talk more about, you know, what ETQ does and also what we're focused in. We are a full solution. Uh, we have EHS and quality really diving into many different industries, life sciences, manufacturing, discrete manufacturing, uh, aviation. So we have quite a bit, of, quite a few products and quite a few things that we're looking at. So i love to talk to you. We can talk more about risk management and other items as well. So please stop by if you are in the Atlanta area. I look forward to talking to you. And with that, I will open up uh, to the audience for any questions that you may have. Great job, Sean. Thank you for your excellent insights and expertise. Uh, before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. Survey should be appearing on your screen. Your input is important because it will help us improve future webcasts. If you do not see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. Okay, now let's get to some questions. Uh, what does the future of risk management look like to you? Well, as I mentioned, I really believe the future risk management is looking at these, you know, edge devices, the really having the integration of people, process, and technology, really having that integration of, you know, collaboration. And, you know, we can't just look at technology. We have to make sure we have the people and the human aspect as well. So I really see, you know, obviously Internet things and artificial intelligence being a part of, being a part of the role, but I really see people having, you know, looking at the behavioral side as well and making sure that people have buy-in and really trusting, you know, technology, people, and processes to move forward. Our next question, how does one get an organization to switch from a reactive to a more proactive approach to risk management? Yes, uh, I believe, you know, again, safety culture is a big part of this right here. So, um, you know, proactive safety culture. Um, I think the big thing is really getting that buy-in. And, and teaching employees, teaching, you know, employees being management, frontline employees and everyone else about the importance of proactive risk management. Um, you know, this can be done through training. This can be done through communication. Um, I know in my past uh, we had quite a few of these proactive measures being done, and we were actually at a point where people and employees on any given day would coach employees. You know, they would do train-to-trainer programs. They would actually coach, and if they saw something that was risky or something that was a safety hazard, they would actually, you know, put them aside, talk to them, and tell them why it wasn't safe. Um, and, and this was something that was done daily. This was a cultural thing, really, really coming down to um, the employees trusting the system of risk management and wanting to go home safely and not be injured. So I think it really does look at, you know, making sure all your employees are engaged, making sure that they really believe in the proactive approach, and, uh, and getting that buy-in. What's the uh, most successful implementa implementation of proactive risk management that you've seen? I would say from my experience, um, I've seen quite a few implementations. I would say it was actually on the quality side through Hasbro. So back when, you know, quite a few years ago when I did some work over there, um, it was out in Massachusetts, actually. Um, they were the ones that were building the Monopoly and Connect 4 lines, and they essentially did a dual quality and ergonomics. Um, this was actually research being done when I was doing research up there. 
essentially looking at uh, switching the lines around. So they had a you know single line we talked about where the product flow was you know multiple people working on the, the line, lots of walking and moving parts and twisting motions, which were an ergonomic hazard. Um, so essentially what we did is we did a full-out FMEA analysis. We essentially sat in a room with the quality folks, the EHS folks, and went through what can happen to the product with this type of motion and product line. So we actually looked at you know, is there going to be more scratches in the bottom of the box based on the way the product's set up because of a bottleneck, for example? So with the current design, they essentially had a straight line. There wasn't enough time for the employees to properly put product into the boxes or, you know, plastics, whatever, dice into the actual box. So they'd be propping in a line that would basically get stacked up, and then the conveyor system would actually rub against the bottom, causing scratches, which is a quality defect as well. So what, what happened is we went through all the different hazards, all the, the probability of things happening, and essentially redesigned the entire line to a U-shaped line, also moving feeders to um, in front of the employees so that they can basically have a pick-and-place operation that is directly in front of them. And then all the props at the end of the line were going around the U, there was no backup, no more bottleneck. Um, so really looking kind of the industrial engineering side of things as well, um, you know, that's my background. So it, it was great because it showed quality and the, you know, reducing the twisting motion of employees previously because the feeders um, were essentially far away and they had to essentially go behind them, put the product in the box, which is also the motion um, that affected them as well and which caused more time down the line, which caused the bottleneck. So I found that to be really interesting and uh, quite a successful implementation. Actually, say the company probably millions, I think a million plus dollars just from that, you know, um, just from the, the product that got affected. So it was but a good success. Oh, what risk methodology tools are available? Well, there's uh, quite a few out there. I mean, we talk about SMEA is there, obviously. Um, I would say, you know, from an ETQ perspective, we have quite a few risk tools in our software. So if you're curious about that, you know, I encourage you to look at what we have. Um, but SME being one of them, there's, you know, it depends on what you look at. We talked about the four different types. Um, you know, bow tie is another one we look at. You know, that's looking at some of the more predictive things. Bow tie, especially for aviation, oil and gas, uh, food and beverage. Um, that's, a, that's a big part of it, too. And we are involved with bow tie as well, just for, um, you know, aviation especially. But, um, you know, those are, those are some of the ones you see out there. Um, we talked about the operations research, the predictive and prescriptive analytic tools that are out there. Um, those are, you know, those can be in a, in a variety of ways. It can be through, um, you know, advanced meta heuristics. It can be through calculation statistics tools. There's many of them out there. So um, I encourage um, all to, you know, really look into ETQ if you're curious, because we do have quite a few that are in, in our software platform that can help you, you know, reach operational excellence and, and drive your risk down. Do you see organizations turning toward a predictive or prescriptive analytics to address risk? I do. I think it's going to take time. I know, you know, some organizations are, are really looking at that right now. Um, from, you know, I think the biggest thing is really getting that buy-in up front, making sure that people are, are trying to be proactive about risk. So it's, it's really getting down to making sure people are, are buying in. And I think once they get there, they can kind of move on to the more, more advanced risk tools and really going towards predictive prescriptive analytics. A lot of organizations still are at the, you know, more reactive kind of approach and, and doing more of the emergency planning, more of the crisis management type firefighting. Um, and that's, that's okay. It's just going to take time. It's, um, it, you got to start out, start out at that level, and then you'll eventually get to that uh, predictive prescriptive approach. But I do see it down the line really happening. Um, you could even say the same thing about some of these technologies where companies are starting to really invest in some of these more, you know, mobile type technologies out there. So, you know, getting to doing auditing and inspections and, and incident investigations out in the field using mobile devices, that's another thing we're seeing an increase in, in users. I'm um, really getting to that, you know, place where we can really integrate the people process and technologies and, and use it to mitigate risk. Why does it take so long to uh, get buy-in for a proactive approach to safety? I think it, you know, comes down to, you know, I, I think it really does. It, it's a good question. We had the same issue at, um, you know, a few of my past 
uh, companies I work for, and it does take time. I think a lot of it is, you know, it's, it's, it's some of it's training, obviously. So people need to be trained on the, the hazards and what it can really do. Um, I think it's how you present it as well, how you communicate to your employees. And I think it's even having to do with, you know, management a lot of times, you know, how they perceive risk and, and how they feel about it. Sometimes you might have management that is not totally, they're not totally bought in as well. They might just be doing it because they have to, but you really need to have all sides really understanding what it means to me, how it can affect me, how can it affect, how can it actually affect my fellow employees, and really, uh, you know, that's, it really comes down to that. It really comes down to people really understanding what it is and, and what it could really do, what it could really um, affect. You know, could I come home and have an injury where I, it could be debilitating or where I won't be able to work the next day? If they understand some of these issues, they, you know, not to put a scare factor, but sometimes it has to be that, and you know, it's really showing how you present it. The next question is, I'm looking for a train-the-trainer program for ergonomics, and I've had difficulty finding one. Do you have any suggestions? Train the trainer program. Interesting. Um, I'm curious. So where, where, where they're from? <laughs> what what company? Um, no. Um, so train the trainer. Yes, that's a that's a very interesting question. We actually my uh, maybe a couple maybe a few years ago we actually had a train the trainer program for ergonomics, and it was uh, I won't say the company, but yeah, we we did have that. It was an in-house system. Um, I will suggest, though, that there are a lot of consulting firms out there. Um, I know quite a few of them that do do the trainer trainer programs. Um, I mean, I know I could just say out some companies I'm aware of. You know, Human Tech, for example, is into this. Um, Auburn Engineers, they're actually um, they're a small consulting firm in Alabama. Just to kind of give you ideas. Also, universities. I know there's a lot of really good universities that are involved with ergonomics training. Um, I could say just a few of them off the you know top of my head. I know. You know, Texas a and I know Utah, Michigan, they're all heavily involved with ergonomics. Um, Michigan, I would say, is probably one of, the, one of the better ones in terms of really involving some of the consultants and, and companies in the Ann Arbor area. So I would suggest, if, you know, if you know or, or even in that area, maybe consult on um, talking to some of those people. And I could give you some, I can give you some, probably some context if you like, if you like to meet offline. But I would say it's interesting. Ergonomics has gone, I would say in my experience, a lot more consultants than there are internal. Um, a lot of times the ergonomists are on the services side. So they tend to kind of work with everyone. But um, I have seen as a trend lately, a lot of them are usually consulting or being a contractor. Do you train EHS professionals in risk uh, management methodologies like Bowtie, FTA, FMEA, and HAZOP? So our company, you know, I, we, we basically are working with customers all the time. You know, we're being a software platform company. We are dealing with hundreds and hundreds of customers, and we have hundreds of customers that are using our platform that deal with all the EHS processes, you know, operational or even the utility side of things with risk and, and um, you know, MOC, management change and all that. So we are constantly working with customers. We do have, you know, this is being a webinar, we do this obviously quite a bit. We do, um, we have a customer advisory board that we work with where we are constantly working with customers and how they can, you know, look at more of this risk. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of this stuff. Um, I would say if you would, you know, in terms of training one-on-one, -on -one. we're not, you know, I know we do some of this, but we're mostly a software platform. So we're, you know, we're obviously giving the knowledge out there, but we're not going to be out there doing the one-on-one -on -one training. I, with having said that, we do, you know, I mentioned, you mentioned Bowtie, we are going to be at the, um, you know, we're, we're very heavily involved in aviation um, as part of our industry. So we will be giving some presentations in um, the annual meeting. If you guys are familiar with CARM, which is looking at bow tie methodologies. We will be at the annual meeting in Dallas Fort Worth area, American Airlines area, where we'll be actually talking about different issues for bow tie for more uh, more non aviation related, so like oil and gas and some other industries. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded to our speaker. Once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Sean Salvis, everyone at ETQ, and all of our listeners. 
Thank you, and have a safe day.